and I am a concurrent student at the Clinton School of Public Service here pursuing my Master of Public Service degree and at the UAMS Faye W. Bozeman College of Public Health and I want to talk to you a little bit about what I've been doing for the past six months with my capstone project. I'm really excited about working to um, address health disparities, specifically in the African American community. And what I'm finding in the research is that the African American church is a really strong entity that can be used to address these health disparities. And so my capstone project is kind of a work that addresses that issue. Just to talk to you about what I want to outline today, I'm going to give you a little bit of background which kind of addresses why health disparities exist um, and why this project is important. And then I'm going to introduce you to my community partner, Better Community Development Incorporated, which is here in Little Rock, Arkansas. Then I'll talk to you about my actual project. I'll give you a little rundown of my methodology. And then we'll talk about what comes next after my project because this work is not done. Um, when you think about health disparities, uh, the Center for Disease Control and Prevention gives a really good definition of it, but basically it's the idea that public health exists so that we can ensure the conditions for people to be healthy. And whenever groups of people are not as healthy as other groups of people, you have a disparity. These groups can be based on gender, they can be based on ed uh, education level, socioeconomic status, geographic location, but what I'm really interested in is the health disparities that occur because of race and ethnicity. So that's what my project is a little bit about. Um, the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services started addressing this issue long before 2000, but I want to kind of just back up to some goals that they started um, talking about uh, specifically with the Healthy People 2000 goals. And so these are decade-long goals that were designed to address health disparities, to identify what we wanted to do to see uh, better health outcomes in certain communities. And so they identified the communities that they wanted to work um, to address the health disparities. And I want to focus specifically on the African American community. They had sub objectives within each community. Um, and the African American community talked about things like uh, reducing um, accidental deaths due to homicide, due to gun violence. Um, and some of those things were actually addressed in two, between the 2000 to 2010 decade. But things such as uh, chronic illness, heart disease, cancer, and stroke were not addressed. As you can see, um, the gap between African Americans and whites is very disparate in each of these areas. And these are all from the Arkansas Center for Health Statistics. So we tried again with Healthy People 2010. And this was to eliminate health disparities. So we went from addressing them, reducing them, to eliminating them as a goal. They identified six areas of health, and I want to focus specifically on the infant mortality because what we know is that a lot of nations use infant mortality as a baseline of what's going on as far as the health is concerned in the country. As you can see, our goals are here, the target for 2010, and all of the rates are a little bit higher than the target, but look at what's going on with the African American community. It's almost three times that of the goals in 2010. So those, those, were not, those goals were not met. So now we're kind of functioning under our Healthy People 2020 goals. These, this goal is to achieve health equity, eliminate disparities, and improve the health of all groups. That's where my community partner comes in. Better Community Development Incorporated is located in the 12th Street Corridor, and I'll kind of give you some orientation to that in a minute. It was initially founded in 1967 as Black Community Developers, um, and they had a grant that was by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. This uh, organization is a nonprofit organization that has a drug treatment facility, both, both inpatient and outpatient. It has an HIV AIDS ministry. It uh, works to um, promote home ownership, and you'll see this is the Empowerment Center, and it looks much more finished now because it is. It's there on the South Street uh, quarter, but that was in, when it was in process. It has a gang intervention program and permanent and supportive housing, but what I really like about BCD Inc. is it focuses on the whole picture of public health. The target area is the 12th Street Corridor, and just to orient you a little bit, this is War Memorial, and this is UAMS, this is I-630, so it's the area south of I-630 where this green line is. 
We actually have a, a practicum team from the Clinton School that's right in this area, and this is the future home of the Children's Library. So it's the area from Jonesboro Street to Woodrow, and this is the Willie Hinton Neighborhood Resource Center, which is where BCD Inc. And the mission is to improve the quality of life for low-income, underserved, disadvantaged, and at-risk children, youth and families in Little Rock, Arkansas, by reversing the adverse health outcomes found within the 12th Street Corridor community. Just to give you a little background of the 12th Street Corridor and why this is an important area for this project to flourish, um, this community is 71% African American. The mean income is about 26,000, a little bit over 26,000. Um, as far as amenities and resources, is, as resources in this area, there's not a pharmacy at all in this entire um, community. Um, this is the most populated, densely populated per capita area in the entire city of Little Rock. Um, there are places to purchase tobacco, liquor, but there's one full service grocery store. Lots of convenience stores, but just one. They recently added a bike lane, but uh, if you've talked to the community, um, they're not used to this, so that's not something that's been used. There's no gym. This is just a fertile ground for this project. Um, but what's most interesting to me about this is, uh, remember I talked about the African American church and the role that it can play in promoting health in the African American community. There are 15 churches in the 12th Street Corridor. So BCD Inc. noticed this and noticed this as a potential resource to address the health disparities. But what's been found is that um, although the, t the churches are in this area, some, some of the churches are kind of resistant to addressing health. It's not because this is not important to them, but a lot of the African American churches don't see this as priority. They are attending to the spiritual needs of the congregation, and they don't really have time. And so I want to quote one of my community partners that's in here today, Pastor Malik Safir of Teresa Hoover United Methodist Church, that said, the church used to be a refuge of escape from persons and injustice. Now it has become a refuge of escape from ourselves. And one of my um, other community partners, who's actually my preceptor, said that we have this spiritual man taken care of. Now we need to work toward healthier minds and bodies. So this is where my project comes in. The Church Health Survey Capstone Project is designed to address the fact that health disparities still persist in this area, specifically in the 12th Street Corridor. And, um, the purpose of this project is to use the resources, those 15 churches that are in this community, to partner with them to be an internal resource because we have people that have come in from other um, entities externally, but as an internal resource to address the health uh, status concerns um, and use the ministries that are in the black church to address these issues. So I knew that there were things that I didn't know about this area, and I knew that there were a lot of things that I needed to learn, and I had to apply um, basically the Clinton School curriculum and the curriculum at the UIMS College of Public Health to um, better understand this project and, and be successful. Um, I first had to understand the community, um, and I think that's something that we talked a lot about in professionalism, basically getting to know the organization, doing your research, and applying what you know about the organization to effectively address how the interactions are with the organization and the community. Um, relationships with the community, I, um, one of my community partners will tell you if I hadn't responded to an email within a week or if they hadn't heard from me, they wanted to keep being partners and they wanted to make sure that they um, were actively involved and so they would check on me and they would make sure that um, they knew the status report of um, the project. Community conversations, specifically conversations about things that are difficult to talk about and in, communi in communications we were um, charged with learning how to facilitate conversations on race. And that was something that was really um, a taboo subject, but not only race for this project, but health disparities as it relates to race. And how do we talk about that? And how do we respectfully address this issue in the community that's experiencing it? Also, I was privileged to be on a practicum team that actually went to Helena, West Helena, to uh, facilitate conversations on race. So that was um, perfect training. Uh, community level politics and social organization was something that we learned about a lot in law and ethics. Um, when I went as, was in this community, I had to respect the fact that pastors are a little territorial about their uh, congregation, and rightfully so. So I had to learn how to navigate those uh, frameworks within the community. Also, the hard skills of survey design, needs assessment, and data analysis that we talked a lot about in um, 
decision analysis with Dr. Bavon. And although community philanthropy is not a part of the Clinton School curriculum, the center uh, taught me a lot about how whenever you're having a concern in the community, you should look into the community to see what the solutions are and make sure the community know that the resources are available to them that they already have. And so those are all things that I had to make sure I, I understood before I started this project. One of the other things that I had to learn was the idea of community-based participatory research. And the Kellogg Foundation has a good definition for this, but basically it's the idea that the community must be involved at every phase of the project. When I first got the project from um, the UAMS College of Public Health, the idea was just to address health disparities using faith community. Well, that's broad, so I had to go to the community, I had to talk to them about what's in your community, what resources do you have, what do you need, and how can I help you? And that's the idea of CBPR. So just to give you a breakdown of my project methodology, I divided it into four phases. The first phase was relationship building, which I've talked a little bit about before, data collection, literature review, and survey design. So the first phase, relationship building, of course, we um, operated under the CBPR model for the entire uh, duration of my project, making sure that the community partners were actively engaged in every phase of the project, whether it was from the project definition to the research of the project to making sure that the project was sustainable at the end. Uh, the needs assessment was the idea that I had to go into the community, talk to them about what they needed, made sure that I, was, I had the resources available that I couldn't, if I didn't have them, make sure that I could point them to where they needed to go, making sure the partnerships were formed between me and the community, made sure they, making sure they trusted me, making sure that, that my motives were pure and that I was just as passionate about the work as they are, and making sure that we had common goals in mind was the first phase, and that had to be done before I could go anywhere with the project successfully. The second phase of my project was actually gathering the data. So once we decided this was the project that we were going to complete, we had to see what the health looked like in, in the community. And I actually, my preceptor is an epidemiologist by trade, so we had a lot of access to data, the raw data about what was going on in the 12th Street corridor, what was going on, going on in 72204, and these are just some of the sources that we obtained that data. Um, but because it was so much, and because it was raw data, I had to extract that and make sure I organized it in a way that the community could make sense of um, so that we could see what it looked like, what the, what the health status looked like. And uh, second, or thirdly, <laughs> um, we had to um, find interventions that were designed to address the health status concern. So once we determined what the project was, and then we gathered the data that talked about what was going on as far as the health in the community, we had to see are there any empirically supported interventions that have been designed to address these concerns. And what we found was that the typical concerns in the community were in four groups, and I've listed these four groups here. Um, HIV AIDS was, uh, diagnosis was a concern in this community, mental illness, substance abuse was a concern, and chronic illness. So we had to find re, uh, interventions in the literature that were designed to address these in faith communities, specifically in African American faith communities. And I've put two examples here that I really want you to go and look at later, but the basic tenet of these two um, interventions was that you had health educators that came into the communities, the faith communities, the churches, um, not to educate and then leave. They came into the communities, they talked to the pastors and the leaders in the communities and equipped them with the resources so that they could use prayers and scriptures and sermons that addressed faith, or addressed uh, faith related health messages and um, then they would preach those from the pulpit or sing those from the choir. And then after service, they would have brochures or other pieces of literature that would support those messages. So that's the BLESS project and the Bomb and Gilead project. And finally, the survey design phase of my project was that once we had, had, we had the data and then we had the interventions that were designed to address the health status concerns that we found, we had to go into the community and talk to the pastors about how can we apply what we found to your specific church. And so we knew that we had to survey them and talk to them about what they already have, what they feel like they need to have, and then how we can be in, of assistance to um, promote those healthy messages in their congregation. So we formed these sur this survey by two ways. We actually looked at the research to 2011 Berthus 
and other aspects of the literature that had actually tools that were related to uh, surveying faith communities, African American faith communities. And then once that survey uh, was distributed among like, community partners, uh, some of them didn't like some items or some of them wanted to add some items. And so we actually collaboratively designed, redesigned a survey that was validated in the literature but also included some items that the community saw fit to include. So just to recap, my project, uh, which I'll show you actually in a minute, I have the document that um, I produced, but it includes the health status data, what's going on in 72204, then the best practice research, what's going on in the literature that addresses the data, then the survey. But I think the most important outcome of my project was the fact that the community become engaged in something that was promoting health in a way to address the health disparities in this area. And they were committed to the sustainability of this work in the 12th Street Corridor. So I now understand uh, three things, <laughs> how important it is to continue to communicate with the community. As I said, whenever I um, hadn't given them a timely update or if they felt like I wasn't including them in something or they are left in the dark, uh, I got an email or a phone call or a uh, text message saying, what's your status report? What's going on with this project? And so when you're involving the community, you have to involve the community at every part of the process. Um, related, the effectiveness of CBPR, um, how important it is to make sure the community is participating in the research and in the project design and making sure that that's um, a part of every aspect of your project so that it's sustainable and that it continues even after you're done. And then how to apply community philanthropy concepts. I think a lot of times um, in the 12th Street Quarter, there's a lot of people coming in from other organizations um, or other um, uh, health professions are coming in. And I think that it's really important to understand that what they needed was really there. It just needed to be brought out and they needed to recognize um, and appreciate the expertise that was already in the community. So uh, just a conclusion and by way of um, discussion, the project, as, I, as I've already addressed, uh, is really sustainable because um, this work was already something that they wanted to do. They just needed, again, someone to just bring it out and, and make sure that they recognized that they had the resources available. They just needed it organized and they just needed the partnerships. Um, and that's the collaboration that I've listed here. Um, we have mental health professionals, we have um, an epidemiologist, we have BCD Inc. Um, that's committed to this work. We have pastors, we have other healthcare professionals that are all committed to collaborating um, with this work. So it's not done. Um, there's more research to be done. And in fact, I'll be involved with that research. Um, I'm not finished at the College of Public Health pursuing my uh, Master of Public Health degree. So next semester, I'll be working with them um, with my integration project to actually implement the survey that I designed. And here are my references. Thank you so much. I forgot to mention, I actually have my deliverable here, um, and I'm really proud of that. And then here are some, um, just some uh, resources from the community that have already uh, been established. These are just like uh, how you promote healthy messages um, in faith communities, and these are here for you to review at the end. Thanks, Ryan. Thank uh, we'll open questions up to the faculty first, and then the time remains. Yes. Ryan, I was, uh, I'm really impressed with the well, first of all, all, all of your work. Thank you. Um, in putting together, using uh, the participatory research method, um, and then also uh, doing best practices, and then trying to match, and, and looking at doing that, finding the best practices, and then matching them to the community. So going in and doing the um, need survey, but also trying to find a match between what you had found being best practices and what they, uh, the community was telling you they needed or what was a good match for them. Right. Um, I have two questions. One is, what was easy in that, mm -hmm. and then what was hard? Um, let's do what was hard. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Make it end with a positive note. Um, it was difficult because I um, am used to the academic setting. So I'm used to finding all the articles and writing about them. 
And I would show those to my community, one of my community partners that's here and to Dr. Rashid, and they would be like, that's not what we asked for. We didn't ask for a report. We asked for something that can be applied to this community. So it was hard to um, make sure that I had the academic side, because that's important, make sure that the research was there, but then make sure that that could be applied to the 12th Street Corridor community, because some of the interventions were not, I mean, they're not something that would be useful to them. So I had to make sure um, what I was researching was relevant. Um, and the easy, uh, did you say easy or <laughs> did you say less hard? <laughs> <laughs> what was, what were you, I want to answer your question. What was, I said easy but less hard. <laughs> um, uh, it was less difficult because I'm really passionate about it. I'll, I'll say that because um, I really, um, I'm, I'm from Little Rock originally, so I'm very familiar with this area and uh, I'm really passionate about health disparities. And so um, it wasn't just work for me. It wasn't just a project for me. So I think that that made it easier that um, I could do this work and not have any, um, any form of compensation other than a grade. Um, but I, it, it was something that I would do anyway. That's fair. I, I just I think that that's great. And when you said getting the data in a way that the community could understand it and use it, mm -hmm. that's mm -hmm. great. Ryan, let me say before I get to a couple of questions, I've probably sat through 125 plus capstone presentations, and your presentation was as good as any I've ever seen. Thank you. Your presentation skills were absolutely remarkable. And if organizations were here looking to hire somebody, they would hire you on the spot. Thank you. Really, Thank you. Really, really good. And Thank I, you. I, that was as good a contact and presentation as I have ever seen. Thank so you. My hat's off to you. Thank you, Dean. Uh, the, the, the 12th Street Quarter thing is really interesting. We had a discussion about it this morning in administrative staff meeting. And, and and I saw your I saw the map where you showed the, the what um, the, the 12th Street quarter that area. Just a question and what to help me understand okay. a little bit better. We also almost have bookends at 12th Street because I serve on the board of Children's Hospital. You got UAMS at one mm -hmm. end, and 12th Street actually runs into Children's Hospital. So we have two of the finest mm -hmm. medical facilities in the state anchoring this corridor, which obviously, uh, as you pointed out, needs um, tremendous attention. What do we, how do we, how do we, how do we take two great assets in the neighborhood and translate that into helping you and other organizations doing that? Um, I think it's kind of how I answered um, Dean Hoffpower's uh, original question. I think um, and not to be critical of organizations, but I think well, go ahead. Um, of, of these large institutions, you can't just come in with your research and plop an intervention and then leave. You have to get to know the community. And I think that's the mindset that I had initially, too. I said, oh, well, this has been validated in the research, so this must be able to apply in the 12th Street Corridor. And I think a lot of the interventions have been setting up, let's set up this uh, health um, whatever uh, entity in this community and people will come or let's put a bike trail in this community and people will ride a bike. Well, if you would have talked to residents of the community, that, that it's a four lane street condensed to two now. So how do they feel about that? And are, they, are there actually people in the 12th Street corridor that ride bikes? And so I think it's very important to make sure that those uh, large hospitals um, actually get into the community and do the research and the needs assessment with the people that are, are actually in the community and not just what has worked in other places or what they feel they know. Just to uh, also echo the Dean, I thought you did an amazing job. Thank you. This is a very big project and a very uh, meaty area. And so I, I think I commend you for choosing this because there's so many other areas of the city where you could have done a similar type of project, but this particular uh, area was challenging. And so I want to commend you for doing that. I just want to ask a question about the idea of spirituality and health, mm -hmm. and whether or not you've had um, any difficulty or what were some of the lessons learned from that conversation with the faith-based community, because just by 
it's tradition, sometimes a faith-based community may turn away from medical intervention mm -hmm. and rely solely on their faith. Mm -hmm. um, and you're offering that it's really both. Mm -hmm. So how did you navigate that conversation in a way that, that allowed them, and I know you did this, mm -hmm. I've read your great paper, mm -hmm. but how did you navigate that conversation to make people understand that these pieces really do go together? Uh, one of my community partners is a physician and a pastor by trade, and so he was the person that I talked to a lot about that. How do you you reconcile your training with your spirituality and they don't have to be a dichotomy and he talked a lot about how you have to respect the communities that you're going into and you have to acknowledge the fact that they have um, notions about what it means to be healthy and so and what it means to be cured and so it's not about saying well don't pray just go to the doctor it's saying well when you pray do this in addition to that or how to integrate messages like the the two interventions that I talked about that I mentioned how do you integrate integrate these healthy messages into things that they're already doing scriptures that they're already reading sermons that they're already listening to um, I think that's what you're asking. Okay. A couple more minutes. Jesse. Jesse. Um, after your first six months of research, I want to know if you're optimistic about the goals of 2020. And in addition to needs assessment, going out into the community and applying research directly to the community, what are the steps needed to meet those goals? Um, <laughs> I am optimistic, uh, first of all. Um, I don't like the wording of the healthy people things. I, I think that uh, we need to be realistic. I think that once um, we understand how to develop those partnerships first, um, to talk to the community about what's already in your community, what's already um, available to you as far as health resources, I think um, a lot of the interventions have been externally um, imposed into the community, but uh, later today I'm going to the Health and Wellness uh, Center that's uh, opening up um, as a partnership with UAMS. But I think um, moving forward to address those concerns, I think just, I know I keep repeating this, but we have to talk to the community about what's worked in the community thus far, um, and then design those interventions based on what they're saying. So I think that's how we'll meet those goals. Does that answer your question? Yes. Right, I remember when Reverend Robinson started the Black Community Developers and had such an enormous impact uh, all over the, well, all over the region. Uh, and I think he deserves a lot of credit for sort of this focus on the 12th Street quarter long before a lot of people. Mm -hmm. And I'm glad to see the BCD, and that it, it, it's a natural evolution along mm -hmm. that. How do we how do we link the good work that BCD is doing and you're doing with other projects going on concurrently in the 12th Street corridor? How do we is there I mean do we need a, a 12th Street corridor summit to so that every, the left hand knows what the right hand's doing? I, you've done a good job at Community mm -hmm. Outreach. I appreciate your thoughts on that. I think that's important. I was at BCD uh, about a week ago and uh, one of Miss Bell was talking to um, me about the fact that there's something going on uh, with the children's library. I'm not sure exactly, um, but she had no idea what it was going on, but it was related to something that BCD Inc. was doing. And I think, yeah, it's important to, to talk. It's important for the community to be aware about what's going on so they know what resources um, are available. And it's important for these larger organizations. Uh, BCD Inc. is the second largest organization, only second to one of the churches um, in that area. And so I think it's important for everyone to talk. And I think that that's part of the concern, that no one's been talking about what interventions I'm doing. Um, and it's, it's kind of the problem with um, this might reveal a bias, but I think with uh, not-for-profit organizations, our motivation is not uh, money, obviously. That's not why we're in this. But we kind of want to buy for um, uh, change and for the first person to, to produce that change and to produce those interventions. And we shouldn't be competing for resources or for uh, whatever deliverables that we think we have, we should be working together. And I think that's most important moving forward to achieve those goals that um, Jesse was asking me about earlier. Good, thanks. All right, great job. Thank you.